Ya, la sesión. Y hoy de nuevo tenemos la, la fortuna en estas dos sesiones que habíamos acordado de, de, esta, de tener con nosotros a, a Desmond Sheridan. Uh, thanks Desmond for coming again to, to, to our hospital and give this uh, new lecture. That is a, a new lecture on the, the heart evolution and the heart evolution after the photosynthesis uh, development. I, The, the previous lecture was really very exciting about the history of the, of the heart, the, evolution, the historic evolution of the heart, and this is a, patho a physiologic evolution of, of the heart. So we are excited of uh, getting you here with us in, 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 the, in this, uh, our sessions uh, and giving this new lecture. And uh, obviously, we are wait for you in, in a near future for new activities and we will enjoy also getting you here with us. So we, we, we can start this, this new lecture and this uh, lecture about the heart evolution after the photosynthesis uh, development. We can skip, yeah. <sighs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You can hear me, I hope. Thank you very much, Jose, for the invitation to come back to Santiago, which I, I always love coming back here and really look at the weather we've had for Easter. It's just been fantastic. It's been, been really good. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Oh. So the last time I came, I spoke about the origin of the word heart, where it came from and how it evolved. And today I'd like to talk about the evolution of the heart. And in doing so, I have intentionally linked this to the onset of photosynthesis. And I hope the reasons for this will become clear as I go through the talk. The emergence of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago made aerobic metabolism possible. This was critical in the evolution of life because aerobic metabolism generates about 18 times more energy per molecule of carbohydrate than anaerobic metabolism. And so it had a huge effect on the evolution of life. Organisms responded 
by developing larger and more complex bodies, and hearts were then needed to pump oxygen around the body, and a medium in which to transport it. Oxygen is the most immediately pressing nutrient for almost all organisms, including humans, in that in its absence we quickly become disabled. In this sense, the most vital function of the heart is to pump oxygen around the body. When the Earth was formed 4.7 billion years ago, the atmosphere contained no oxygen or virtually no oxygen. This slide shows the subsequent emergence of oxygen in the atmosphere over time. On the horizontal axis, we have time in billions of years. The red and green lines are geologists' estimates of the oxygen level in the atmosphere over various, at various times since the origin of the Earth. The first living cells appeared about 3.7 billion years ago. That's 3,700 million years ago. And these were simple bacteria like organisms, prokaryotes, like cyanobacteria, which were capable of anoxygenic photosynthesis. In response to a photon of light, the enzyme photosystem 2 released an electron which could be transported along an electron transport chain and used to generate, to store energy in the form of ATP and later to build carbohydrate molecules. For this process to continue, however, the electron released had to be replaced. And this is provided by a number of sources, and particularly hydrogen sulfide in the oceans and other substances. And that's shown here at the bottom. So we have carbon dioxide plus hydrogen sulfide and light leading to a carbohydrate structure, the release of sulfur and water. And this had, this, if you like, provided the energy for the initial expansion of life on Earth. And then around 2.5 billion years ago, cells evolved oxygenic photosynthesis, shown here. So it's just over half the lifetime of the Earth. And this involved an evolutionary modification of the enzyme photosystem 2, which made it possible to split water into molecular oxygen and hydrogen. This also released an electron, which could be used to replace the electron released in response to photosynthesis and thus restore the sensitivity of the chlorophyll in these bacteria. It also led to a huge release of oxygen into the, into the oceans and into the atmosphere. And it can be argued to be perhaps the most significant event in the history of the Earth in the evolution of life because of the impact it had on the way life emerged thereafter. So we have carbon dioxide plus water plus light leading to a carbohydrate structure, oxygen and hydrogen ions. Following the onset of oxygenic photosynthesis, initially there was relatively little change in oxygen levels in the atmosphere for a period of about 80 million years. And that's shown here. So very little change for about 80 million years. And this was because the oxygen released into the oceans reacted with chemicals dissolved in the oceans, particularly iron, which formed precipitate which fell to the ocean floor where it hardened into characteristic rock formations. These are known as banded iron formations, and the dark lines are simply a reflection of iron oxide deposited on the earth two and a half billion years ago. And these deposits of iron oxide represent about 60% of all of, the or all of the iron ore currently used in the earth. And it always strikes me as being an astonishing fact to think that all of the iron and steel we use for making motor cars, washing machines, or what have you, was actually laid down by bacteria like organisms two and a half billion years ago. So once these oxygen sinks in the oceans then became depleted and used up, then oxygen began to accumulate in the atmosphere. From almost nil to around 15 millimeters of mercury about 2 billion years ago. So shown here in the red line. So from nil to about 2 billion years ago, we have a rise to about 15 millimeters of mercury. 
That's quite low compared to present levels, about 10%. And although it's small, it had a dramatic effect, making aerobic metabolism possible from then onwards. And it's known as the great oxidation event in the history of the Earth. It led to the first multicellular organisms, which became widespread over the next billion years. During this period, organisms consisted of relatively simple structures containing a limited number of cell types. Up to this time, most photosynthesis took place in the oceans. But then between about 1 billion and 500 million years ago, terrestrial photosynthesis spread across the Earth as plant life became widespread on the surface of the Earth. And this led to a more marked increase in atmospheric oxygen levels. And this is the same data shown on the previous slide, but the time is concatenated and the time has been transposed for simplicity. So time is shown now on the vertical axis in millions of years. And again, the red and green lines are geologist estimates of the oxygen levels in the atmosphere. So between about a billion, a thousand million and 500 million years ago, oxygen levels increased to around the current level of 150 millimeters of mercury. It was also associated with a dramatic ex explosion of life evolution on Earth, known as the Cambrian explosion, when over a period of just 30 million years, which in geological terms is a blink of an eye, we had a, a huge uh, variation, evolution of organisms, mollusks, arthropods, and vertebrates. Organisms responded by developing larger and more complex bodies <coughs> and they needed systems for delivering oxygen more effectively. Around 800 million years ago, multicellular organisms called metazoa evolved from protozoa. The most primitive forms still extant in the world today include sponges, coral, and jellyfish. These simple diploblasts have developed from just two germ layers, endoderm and ectoderm, and they're able to derive oxygen and nourishment by direct diffusion from the seawater. And then between 600 and 700 million years ago, a third germ layer emerged, mesoderm, to form triploblasts, which developed again more complex bodies. Triploblasts such as flat earthworms, like fasciola hepatica or liver fluke, which is a serious cause of illness, of course, uh, are small, simple flatworms and they're so small and flat that they can derive sufficient nourishment, again, directly from their skin and also from the gut. However, animals, as they became larger and more complex, then they needed more, greater energy and more oxygen. And to meet this, more complex circulatory systems began to emerge. The earliest circulatory system to evolve consisted of an internal body cavity called a coelome. And of course, we're all coelomates because we develop a coelomate cavity during embryonic development. This develops between the ectoderm and the endoderm and is filled with coelomic fluid. Coelomic circulatory systems do not have a pump. Instead, fluid is circulated by the action of motile cilia attached to mesoderms, mesothelial cells, which line the coelomic cavity, creating a convection of fluid through the organisms. This is far more efficient than simple diffusion and allowed animals to develop larger and more complex bodies. However, convective fluid movement is limited and poorly directed. And so coelomates are segmented organisms with each segment having a separate coelomic cavity providing for local nutrition and gas exchange. These restrictions were overcome by the evolution of blood-based vascular systems around 600 million years ago. And these transport fluid through the length of the body. And then around 500 million years ago, blood vascular systems evolved an endothelial lining of cells uh, derived from mesothelium. And in addition to transporting flu fluid and gases, these also facilitated clotting mechanisms, immune defenses, regulation of heat, and also ultrafiltration of waste by perfusing kidneys. Circulatory systems evolved into broadly in two forms open systems and closed systems. All vertebrates have closed systems, while invertebrates have involved both open and closed systems. 
In open circulations, there are no arteries and veins, or no direct connections between arteries and veins. Instead, fluid passes through tissue spaces throughout the body, which are continuous. Open circulations are found in arthropods, such as insects, crustaceans, and in some mollusks, such as clams, snails, and slugs. Drosophila melanogaster, also known as fruit fly, exemplifies this arrangement very well. Drosophila is a small insect, about 2.5 millimeters in length. It has a heart tube along the rear, the posterior of the abdomen, which beats about 200 to 300 times per minute and circulates hemolymph in an open circulation. Hemolymph-like blood carries oxygen, but it does so using hemocyanin, a protein containing copper rather than the iron found in hemoglobin. Hemolymph is colorless when blue, but is colorless, but turns blue when oxygenated, and this is reflected here and in subsequent slides. So hemolymph is pumped by the heart tube through the aorta and from there through tissue spaces throughout the body, carrying nourishment and oxygen. There are no veins. Instead, blood re-enters the heart tube through a series of ostia at the rear of the posterior of, of the insect, of the here of the abdomen. And this is facilitated by the alary muscles, which are attached to the carapace of the organism and the heart tube. And when it contracts, it widens the heart tube, creating a suction effect, which assists return of hemolymph. Lungs have not evolved in fruit flies. Instead, air enters through tiny pores in the abdomen and passes through multiple channels where it exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide with hemolymph. And to facilitate this, Drosophila is capable of reversing the direction of flow from the heart to pump hemolymph directly into the abdominal cavity. And this is achieved by closing the caudalmost ostia of the heart tube and relaxing the caudal heart valve to pump hemolymph directly into the abdominal cavity where it can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And this remarkable, this evolved 500 million years ago and insects are doing very well or quite well on the earth still. It's functioned very well for their needs for the past 500 million years. I will return to Drosophila a little bit later in connection with other aspects of the evolution of the heart. Mollusks evolved around 500 million years ago and gastropods such as snails and mussels were the first to have a two-chambered heart, pumping hemolymph with a heart rate of around 20 beats per minute and a systolic pressure of 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Gastropods, in gastropods, the atrium and ventricle are in line, separated by an atrioventricular valve. And the ventricular outflow is regulated by a semilunar valve. Gastropods are slow moving animals with a low energy requirement, and this arrangement suits their needs perfectly well. Mollusks such as cephalopods or octopi have more complex bodies and they're more active than other mollusks. And to facilitate this, they have evolved more, more efficient hearts and circulation. They have a closed circulation and blood vessels that are lined by endothelial cells. Octopi have three hearts, a systemic heart, which consists of two atria and a single ventricle, and it generates a pressure of 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury, pumping hemolymph directly through the systemic circulation. The higher systemic pressures drives more efficient tissue perfusion and gas exchange, which matches their higher energy needs. Blood returning to the heart passes through the gills where it is oxygenated and then returns to the heart. However, the vena cava are quite long in the octopus, and so pressure dissipates to quite low levels. And so to facilitate perfusion of the gills, octopi have involved two additional hearts called branchial hearts, which pump the hemolymph at a pressure of about 20 millimeters of mercury, which is ideal for perfusing gill capillaries. These arrangements offer significant advantages which have allowed octopi to develop large and complex bodies and also to be successful predators, 
Indeed, there is some evidence that at one time octopi, octopi may have been the most successful predators and uh, to, to be at the top of the food chain. Their closed circulation also requires a much lower volume of blood and interstitial fluid, which is about 20% of body weight in octopi compared with 50% in gastropods. Vertebrates evolved around 525 million years ago, and they have closed circulatory systems lined by endothelial cells and blood which uses haemoglobin for oxygen transport. Their circulatory plans vary greatly depending on their energy needs. With the exception of a few shark and tuna species, aquatic animals are ectothermic, that is, they're cold-blooded. In addition, the buoyant effect of water greatly reduces the effect of gravity, which also reduces their energy needs. In contrast, terrestrial animals must withstand gravity, which increases their energy needs, and standing upright increases it further. In addition, maintaining a warm body temperature requires energy. The ability to meet these varied demands required a number of evolutionary modifications of the heart and circulation. Thus, hearts of land-based vertebrates have evolved the ability to pump blood at higher pressures. For example, compared to a normal human blood pressure of 130 over 75, blood pressure in fish is just 20 over 10 and 40 over 20 in amphibians such as frogs. All vertebrates have a central pump. However, their chamber arrangements differ depending on their energy requirements. Thus, fish hearts have two chambers, while amphibians have three, and mammals and birds have four chambers. Fish have the simplest circulatory plan among vertebrates. It consists of a single circulation driven by a two-chambered heart. Blood returns to the heart and enters into the single atrium from where it is propelled into the ventricle and then directly through the aorta through into the gills. So it's pumped directly from the heart through the gills, where, of course, it is oxygenated. The lower energy of fish means that they can function with a lower blood pressure of 20 over 10. And this also explains why fish hearts can pump blood directly to the gills without harming their capillaries. Fish have a two-chambered heart, but in contrast to gastropods, the atrium and ventricle have undergone a rotation in an S configuration, which confers a mechanical advantage. So if the atrium and ventricle are now in an S configuration. In addition, the conus arteriosus acts as a buffer on the systolic output of the ventricle, which further protects the gills from, the, from damage. Sharks have a unique communication between the pericardial cavity and the peritoneal cavity. So the red line here shows the pericardium, which is continuous with the peritoneal cavity through the pericardio-peritoneal canal. Under normal circumstances, the pericardium in sharks contains a significant volume of fluid. However, in an excited state, such as a feeding frenzy, shunting of pericardial fluid to the peritoneum permits greater diastolic filling of the heart and by the Frank Starling mechanism, an increase in stroke volume and cardiac output. And this has enabled an important enabler for sharks to be such powerful predators. Amphibians move from an exclusively aquatic to a terrestrial environment around 350 million years ago. Abandoning gills, they rely on lungs for gas exchange. Many amphibians, such as frogs, also maintain a moist skin through which they can also undertake gas exchange. To facilitate this, they've also evolved a unique circulatory plan. Frogs have a three-chambered heart, so blood returning from the, from the systemic uh, circulation enters the right atrium, while the left receives oxygenated blood from the lungs, and then both enters the single ventricle from where it is propelled into the aorta and pulmonary arteries. An important aspect of this is that although there is a single ventricle, there is a high degree of separate streaming of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood within the ventricle.
The frog heart also has evolved a unique system for separating uh, de oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. It has evolved a spiral baffle in the ventricular outflow tract, which effectively directs deoxygenated blood to the pulmonary artery and oxygenated blood to the aorta, as shown here. So we can see uh, oxygenated blood being diverted by the baffle into the aorta and the deoxygenated blood going into the pulmonary artery. And this, of course, is interesting because it's resonant with the way in which the common outflow tract is divided in mammals such as humans to form the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Around the fifth week of intrauterine life, ridges appear on the outflow tract on each side of the left ventricular outflow tract, which increase in size and eventually meet in the center and divide the outflow tract into the aorta and pulmonary artery. It's almost as if frogs have started this process, but haven't quite completed it. This arrangement provides a high degree of functional separation of the pulmonary and systemic blood flows, but unlike the anatomical separation in mammals. In addition, the pulmonary artery gives off a pulmonocutaneous branch, which supplies the skin where blood is oxygenated and then returns to the heart via the systemic circuit, the, uh, the, 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 the vena cava. So oxygenated blood returns from the skin, returns to the heart via the systemic veins, and so is mixed with deoxygenated blood from the tissues. During normal activities, around 25% of pulmonary blood flow reaches the skin and lungs are the main source of oxygen. During diving and hibernation, however, in cold water, the pulmonary arteries are actively constricted, diverting more deoxygenated blood to the skin where it receives sufficient oxygen to meet the low energy needs during prolonged hibernation. Of course, amphibians have a single ventricle and therefore have the same pressure in the pulmonary and systemic circulations. But they also have a low systemic pressure of 40 over 20, which is also suitable for perfusing lung capillaries. Reptiles occupy a transitional position in cardiovascular evolution between the single ventricle of fishes and the double circulation of mammals. Some reptiles, such as crocodiles and alligators, have four-chambered hearts and a completely divided pulmonary and systemic circulation whereas snakes, turtles, lizards, monitors have a single ventricle that is partly divided by an incomplete interventricular septum. The latter have some mixing of venous and arterial blood, but, but this is minimised by the incomplete septum, which directs oxygenated blood to the aortas and venous blood to the pulmonary arteries. Pharaonid lizards, such as Komodo dragons, are terrestrial animals and highly active, and of a high metabolic rate and matching energy requirements. They can meet this by virtue of being air breathers and having almost complete functional separation of the pulmonary and systemic circulations. In contrast, cold-blooded diving reptiles have much lower energy needs. Typically, their oxygen consumption is around five times less than warm-blooded mammals. When diving, they can divert blood from the pulmonary to the systemic circuit by constricting the pulmonary arteries. And this increases systemic blood flow and nutrient delivery. They can also rely on anaerobic metabolism to a much greater extent than mammals because they have a much greater tolerance of lactic acidosis. Crocodiles are of particular interest in that they have developed a fully developed four-chambered heart and yet are well adapted to intense activity when diving. There's no mixing of venous and arterial blood within the heart. However, crocodiles have evolved a unique method for doing so outside the heart. Crocodiles have left and right-sided aorta, as shown here. The left aorta and main pulmonary artery arise from the right ventricle, while the right aorta arises from the left ventricle. And that's shown here. So the left ventricle is connected to the right aorta and the right ventricle is pumping, in this case, directly into the pulmonary artery. During normal activities, without a lot of energy demands, blood from the left ventricle is ejected into the right aorta. But as shown here, crocodiles have a unique communication between the left and right aorta known as the form of Penitza. And under normal circumstances, blood shunts from the, left, from the right to the left aorta, so that in effect, in, in effect, 
and under normal circumstances, the left ventricle is ejecting into the right aorta and from there into the left aorta, while the right ventricle ejects into the main pulmonary artery. However, when diving, however, crocodiles have what's known as a cogwheel valve at the origin of the pulmonary artery. And this closes during intense activity under neurological control, as shown here, blocking outflow to the main pulmonary artery from the right ventricle. And when that happens, the right ventricle then ejects directly into the left-sided aorta. This means that under normal conditions, the systemic and pulmonary circulations are effectively separate. When diving, the cogwheel valve then closes in response to neurological control and outflow to the main pulmonary artery is blocked and the right ventricle ejects exclusively into the left aorta. This arrangement facilitates shunting of blood from the pulmonary to the systemic circuits during diving in a way that's functionally similar to amphibians who achieve a similar result by pulmonary vasoconstriction. It also has a secondary effect in that the left aorta supplies the stomach. And when it's, when it's pumped with deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle, it has a high level of carbon dioxide and therefore carbonic acid, which of course forms when carbon dioxide is mixed with water, it breaks. And the hydrogen ions provided in that way facilitates the production of a much more intense acid secretion in the stomach of crocodiles. And this is why crocodiles can actually take whole prey and really rip the limbs off animals because it can digest large bones because of this more intense acid secretion related to the way that the circulation operates in crocodiles. Available evidence suggests that the circulation of crocodiles evolved these uh, arrangements secondarily, having evolved originally from dinosaurs. Whether dinosaurs had already evolved a four-chambered heart is of interest to evolutionists because it relates to the question as to whether they were endothermic, and that has a lot to do with how their life would have been arranged. Soft tissues are only rarely seen in the fossil record. However, in the year 2000, a well-preserved fossil of an herbivorous uh, dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period, around 70 million years ago, was discovered and this did allow accurate 3D reconstruction of the thorax and it did show good evidence of a four-chambered heart with a single aorta arising from the left ventricle. Mammals of course are endothermic and most are also terrestrial and this greatly increases their energy needs and oxygen utilization. This in turn requires a larger cardiac output and higher blood pressures as well as lungs capable of efficient gas exchange. This is made possible by the four-chambered heart in completely separate pulmonary and systemic circulations. On average, mammals have a, or at least humans, have a systemic, have a, a systolic blood pressure of 130 over 70 and a pulmonary pressure of 25 over 15. In humans, gas exchange takes place, of course, in the alveoli, of which we are estimated to have about 400 million. Efficient gas transfer is facilitated by their very small tissue gap between blood and air of just one to two microns. The high systemic pressures ensures a rapid delivery of nutrients and oxygen to peripheral tissues, while the lower pulmonary pressures allows highly efficient gas exchange. An important requirement of a dual circulation is that flow in each must be perfectly matched. And this was made possible by synchronous control of the heart rate, of course, to ensure that the ventricles contract simultaneously. In addition, the starling response, which provides independent responsiveness of each ventricle to stretch and therefore load, allows each to respond to variations in output by the other. So an increase in venous return to the right heart will induce an increase in force of contraction because of stretch by the right ventricle. And when the increased output from that reaches the left ventricle, it will similarly respond to the increased load. In addition, an additional requirement of low pressures in the pulmonary circulation is that the lungs must be anatomically close to the heart to avoid dissipation of pressure through lung vessels. And so the co-location of the heart and lungs in the chest, protected by a bony cage, was a really important and significant 
evolutionary advantage. Birds, like mammals, are also endothermic, but have even higher energy needs due to the demands of flying. They do this by maintaining a higher blood pressure in mammals of around 160 over 50, with some as high as 200 over 70. Avian heart rates vary with body size, varying from 80 to 330 in swans and 500 to 1200 in hummingbirds. This provides a cardiac output up to six times greater than mammals. In addition, the high pressure in birds, high blood pressure in birds, also assists withstanding high gravitational forces during hunting flight. And so to achieve this, birds have also evolved a four-chambered heart and separate pulmonary and systemic circulations. However, evolution of the bird heart, of the avian heart and mammalian hearts occurred separately. Although both are vertebrates, mammals branched away from early vertebrates around 300 million years ago, while birds evolved from dinosaurs around 175 million years ago. And it's often cited as an example of evolutionary convergence driven by similar evolutionary pressures. So evolution has led to an extraordinarily diverse range of cardiovascular systems. Circulations can be open or closed and pumped by one, two, three or four chambered hearts. What's so remarkable is how evolutionary pressures and natural selection have ensured that each circulatory plan perfectly suits the organism that it supports. There's no superior model. The circulatory performance of birds is many times greater than mollusks. However, such a level of performance would be as wasteful for mollusks as theirs would be insufficient for birds. Our cardiovascular system cannot be said to be superior to that of any other animals. Rather, it's simply exquisitely suited to our needs. I'd now like to turn briefly to evolution of the heart at a genetic and molecular level. And for this, I will discuss some of the key components of the heart. As I mentioned above, Drosophila melanogaster, or fruit flies, have a tube heart driving hemolymph in an open circulation. Drosophila and all vertebrates share a common evolutionary path until about 300 million years ago. And as a result, we also share a significant genetic heritage. Around 75% of genes that cause diseases in humans are also found in Drosophila. And studies of how genes in Drosophila function have also shed light on how genes in vertebrates work. In particular, studies of Drosophila genes which regulate the early development of the heart led to the discovery of genes and factors which also do so in vertebrates. In Drosophila, a protein known as Tin Man is one of these. Tin Man is a transcription factor, meaning it's a protein that binds to DNA at a specific location and facilitates transcription of RNA and protein to make a, a protein based on that sequence of DNA. Expression of Tin Man protein is crucial for heart development in Drosophila. Without a heart, without uh, tin Man, the heart fails to develop. And it was for this reason that it was named Tin Man, after the character in the story of the wonderful Wizard of Oz, which, if you remember, Tin Man was, could not fall in love because he did not have a heart due to, the act, due to the spells of the Wicked Witch. And so this protein was initially called Tin Man. So in Drosophila, Tin Man protein is essential for expression of several genes which regulate early development of the heart. And the discovery of, gene, of Tin Man prompted the search for homologous genes in vertebrates. And this led to the isolation of the NKX gene in mice and subsequently to orthologs of ANKX in a number of different species. In all of these, a conserved pattern of ANKX expression is observed in the developing heart and is essential for its differentiation and development. Thus, despite 300 years since our evolutionary paths diverged, genetic regulation of development of the heart in mammals has remarkable similarities to that of Drosophila. This is often cited as an example of evolutionary conservation, where an evolu a successful evolutionary change in one species is conserved and used in the evolution of future species. Traditionally, Tracing the evolutionary origins of species relied on anatomical comparisons in the geological fossil record. 
However, gene sequencing has made a major advance in phylogenetic research, allowing scientists to compare gene sequences across many species. In simple terms, if the same gene sequence is found, for example, in plants and animals, it follows that the gene was likely to have been present in their common ancestor, and it can be dated to before their separation. The filaments of sarcomeres are called thin and thick filaments, reflecting their characteristic microscopic appearance. And as shown here in electron microscopy, the A band corresponds to thick filaments and the I band to the thin filaments. This slide shows a diagrammatic representation of their molecular anatomy. The thin filaments are composed of two strand-like polymers of actin molecules held together in a double helix, which repeats about every 38 nanometers. And that's shown here. So we have two strands of actin molecules held in a double helix, uh, together with the rest of the contractile machinery that we don't need to talk about here. The individual actin molecules are shown in brown, and they, of course, as you know, interact with the heads of myosin molecules to generate the force of contraction. However, actin is not unique to the heart. In fact, actin is found in all eukaryotic cells and therefore is widely present in nature, <clears throat> including single cell organisms, plants, fungi, moles, as well as animals. The ancestor of all eukaryotic cells is thought to be around 1.8 billion years old. And this means that actin itself has been a functional protein for this length of time. Actin performs multiple roles in cells, including that in the heart, which depend on its ability to form polymers, creating strands known as fibrillar actin. Some examples illustrated here include maintaining the structure of cells, binding of endoplasmic reticulum to mitochondria, endocytosis, endocytosis, transport of particles within cells, as shown here. So we have a vesicle attached to a single my myosin molecule, which is actively tracking along an actin strand, acting as a transport mechanism of cargo within cells. Receptor recycling and protein degradation. Actin is involved in all of these processes. The strands of actin in cardiac thin filaments are specific for that role and are key elements in the contracting machinery, accounting for around 20% of the protein content of cardiac myocytes. They are, however, much older than the heart itself, having evolved around a billion years before the first simple heart tube emerged. Myosins are also ancient motor proteins. Like actin, they evolved in eukaryotes and therefore are of a similar age. Myosins form the thick filaments of muscle and have head, neck, and tail domains, as shown here. Head, neck, and tail domains. The heads have sites specific for binding to actin and ATP to generate the force of contraction, while the tail, dom the tail domains vary depending on the function they provide. In cardiac muscle, they combine to form the thick filaments, as I've tried to illustrate here. Mammals are known to produce 40 genes producing myosins of varying structure for different functions. They can exist as single molecules which transport cargo within cells, so as I showed you, such as large proteins and vesicles. These have a region on the tail domain which binds to cargo, while the head and neck region interacts with an actin strand in a, in a process akin to walking from one actin unit to the next. As I showed for actin, myosins are also involved in many cellular processes such as cell division, transporting other molecules and particles within cells, and as well as muscle contraction. Mutations in genes which encode myosins are known to cause a wide range of abnormalities, and not just in the heart. About 35% of cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are caused by mutations in myosin 2. Myosin 7a, an isoform of myosin, plays a crucial role in transporting melanin and discarded photoreceptor segments in retinal pigment cells. 
and mutations here can cause blindness. And this is a diagrammatic slide showing the transport of a, melanin a melanosome attached to a myosin molecule, which is tracking along an actin strand. And in the same way, discarded used photoreceptor segments in retinal pigment cells are transported for degradation and recycling within the cell by similar mechanisms. Myosin is also responsible for maintaining appropriate tension in stereocilia. These are the sound detecting hair cells in the middle ear where mutations can cause Usher syndrome and deafness. Thus, actin and myosin are much older than the earliest simple heart, having evolved more than a billion years earlier and relatively soon after the onset of oxygenic photosynthesis. <coughs> Regulation of the heart rate and rhythm is a vital aspect of cardiac function, and this was achieved by the evolution of actual potentials of different configurations in the various cell types within the heart, and by carefully regulated spread of actual potentials through the atria and ventricles. Actual potentials are induced by an abrupt depolarization of the cell membrane caused by a rapid influx of positively charged ions, notably sodium and calcium, followed by a, le a slightly less rapid efflux of potassium ions resulting in repolarization. This influx and efflux is regulated by a series of voltage-gated ion channels. There are many of these in the heart, each specific for a particular ion, such as sodium, potassium, or calcium. And the variations in actual potential characteristics in different regions of the heart, as shown here, is due to the presence of different populations of these ion channels in each cell type. Voltage-gated ion channels are proteins that span the cell membrane and open in response to a change in transmembrane potential of the cell. They're membrane-bound proteins with six transmembrane-spanning segments, as shown here. So the grey line represents the cell membrane and these squiggly lines spanning of the protein across the cell membrane. The fourth transmembrane segment, shown here in red, contains several positively charged residues and it undergoes a conformational change in response to a change in membrane potential of the cell. And this in turn opens the, the pore segment of the channel shown in green here. Phylogenetic studies indicate that these voltage-gated channels are truly ancient and are widely distributed in living organisms. The earliest and founder member of what became a large family of ion channels was a voltage-gated potassium channel, which appeared in an early prokaryote cell around three billion years ago. Subsequently, a gene duplication resulted in a two-domain channel, and this function still functioned in lysosomes within cells. And then a further gene duplication resulted in a four-domain channel, which later developed sensitivity, selectivity for sodium and calcium ions. And subsequent mutations led to an extremely large family of these ion channels, which serve multiple functions in all cells throughout the body. And they're involved in all kinds of, such as touch, taste, many, many functions, as well as uh, regulating the heart. These four domain ion channels are responsible for the action potentials in nerves and muscle, including cardiac muscle. In the heart, they regulate the varied configuration of action potentials in each cell type, which maintains the normal heart rate and rhythm. And thus, although the first simple heart evolved around 500 million years ago, these voltage-gated ion channels, which are critical for regulating its function, evolved in the earliest living cells to appear on the Earth 303 billion years ago, at the time that photosynthesis began. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the first simple heart tube evolved around 500 million years ago and subsequently underwent many modifications to support different lifestyles of invertebrates and vertebrates with one, two, three, and four chambers. The evolution of more powerful hearts was driven by the need to provide the greater energy needs of more active, larger endothermic animals, and the ability to pump increasing amounts of oxygen has always been key to this. Thus, the heart can be thought of most essentially as an oxygen pump, and a direct consequence of the rise in atmospheric oxygen following the onset of oxygenic photosynthesis 2.5 billion years ago. Although the first simple 
sing, single chambered heart emerged around half a billion years ago, many of its key proteins were already functioning in the earliest living cells to appear on the Earth three billion years ago, at the time that photosynthesis began and subsequently were conserved through subsequent evolutionary changes to serve in our hearts. Thank you. Yeah. Fascinated overview of the evolution of the heart in the different species and how the, this evolution is for maintain the, the, the function of the of the bodies of the different bodies with the highest efficiency. But uh, for, for, for finishing the, this, this presentation, I would like to to make a comment regarding. I am intriguing, for example, in, in, in the human heart or in the hearts, in particular in the human heart, when you suffer some pathology, for example, heart disease or, or uh, heart failure, uh, we, we, we develop a mechanism of, of a, um, compensation that is not compensation, but is the mechanism that uh, promotes the degradation of the, of the heart, for example. This is the reason why in heart failure you have to block the, the mechanism of compensation that the body uh, put in action uh, for, for, for compensate the, 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 the failure of the, of the heart. Do, do you think that this could improve with the evolution that you, you develop um, through mechanism of compensation, a mechanism of compensation that increase the, the, the the, the, the degradation of the heart. What do you think about this? Because uh, we, we put in action the sympathetic activity, the, the uh, brain and angiotensin system, another system that you have to block for maintain the heart function. What do you think we need much more billion of years for develop authentic mechanism of compensation in the, in the heart pathology? What do you think about it's that? Very interesting. It's a very interesting question. It's almost as if our treatment is contrary to the intuitive trend of evolution. Mm -hmm. So the, the heart evolution wants to make the heart stronger and, and, and we might think the same way. And, and early attempts to treat heart failure were based on trying to drive the heart faster and harder yeah. with more, and it didn't work. But of course, <clears throat> evolution doesn't take a short term view. When we develop heart failure, we're almost usually in most cases, we're beyond the age of reproduction. And as far as evolution is concerned, we're entirely dispensable. We really don't matter so much. So um, I think that our treatment is the right thing to do under those circumstances for the individual patient, but evolution, but evolution isn't really concerned with that. We might look at it another way, and I have written a chapter about this in my book, the last chapter, How to Preserve the Heart, because the reality is that the lifestyle we live is quite contrary to the way the heart has evolved. We're trying to say the heart has spent three billion years evolving to be as perfect as it really is. But we've said, well, we, we're not really interested in that. We want to live a life that's quite different for the way the heart is optimally involved. The reality is that we have evolved as hunter-gatherers the way our ancestors did a million years ago. And very little has changed in an evolutionary sense since that time. So the lifestyle we have is quite different to the way our heart has evolved. The food we eat, apart from, of course, the, the Mediterranean diet, which of course is perfect in the South part. But in the West of Europe and in North America, the problem is that we have moved away from the evolutionary ways in which the, heart's, the heart has developed. And an allied question to that, uh, Jose, is, the human heart has sacrificed the capacity to replicate cells. It is well known that Xenopus and many species can actually replicate their cells. Some species you can just cut out a bit of heart and will grow again. Humans can do that until about three days after birth and then it shuts down and stops. It's actively suppressed. And there is a reason for that too. It's because our heart, the pressure required for our systems to operate are so high that our cardiac myas are literally packed with contractile machinery. In order to get replication to take place, you'd have to de-differentiate all of that, take the cell back to a primitive state, and then allow mitosis to take place. That would be very costly for our hearts to do. And recently, you may have seen in the literature that 
microRNAs have been used to actually reactivate the mitotic process in mammalian cells, specifically in pigs, showing that if you, um, if you do this to pigs with a myocardial infarction, you can improve left ventricular function, but all the pigs died at 10 days with better mechanical function. And the reason they died was because of arrhythmias. And if you think about the way in which each cell is intimately connected electrically to all its adjoining cells, to get a new immature growing cell to correctly link itself in electrically to the rest of the heart is extremely challenging. So evolution has done many wonderful things. And we, we when we go against it, we, um, we do things wrong and we, we, we get into trouble. But, in, but, but the treatments we have evolved, we've come to learn that mm. the best thing is to actually rest the heart, do less, give it a chance to actually cope. Yeah, that's really fascinating because it's very, very important to, to, to not only to promote new drugs for blocking the, 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 the system that uh, um, increase to the, the damage of the heart, but also improving the, system, the systems that may to, to improve the heart function and to protect the heart function, not only blocking the systems that promote the deleterious effect on the heart, but also promoting the, the action of systems. And this could be related not only for uh, uh, exogenous uh, agents or drugs, but also promoting that the, the heart cells uh, produce uh, for example, um, natriuretic peptides of, of uh, hormones like this that promote the, 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 the efficiency of the heart. But it really is a fascinating area, not only for blocking the system that uh, promote the heart uh, the dysfunction, but also stimulate the system that maintain the heart, the, the, the heart heart. Uh, I think this is really fascinating after your lecture that is, uh, we have to, to think how to, to, to produce and who develop new, new, new mechanisms for, for heart protection, and in this case for health protection. So thank you so much for your, for your lecture and your, we hope you will enjoy the rest of your stay in Santiago and you, you, you travel to, 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 Port, to Portugal and we await for you here in Santiago the next time that you hope to be very soon. So thank you and good. Thank you.